sperm meets egg. And the miraculous journey towards human life begins. But in this case, something even more extraordinary happens. The fertilized egg splits into two, creating identical twins. Then each egg splits again, estimated as a one in 64 million occurrence. Identical quads. For the first time, revolutionary new imaging techniques allow us to follow in minute detail three very different pregnancies. These identical twins these triplets conceived on different days. And these remarkable quads. Through them, we explore the stories and science of human reproduction's ultimate marvel. The miracle of multiple births. This child is about to be born. But for her, the womb has been no placid ride. Nor will her birth be the first time she has met other humans. She has been sharing this space with not one, but three siblings. has grown from an egg, smaller than the size of a grain of sand. Solitary and unaware. To one of four sisters. Touching, reacting, and what looks like kissing. They have fought for nourishment and space. Yet they lay the foundation for a lifetime of warmth, comfort, and companionship. They've helped each other develop. And they've forged a connection and behavioral patterns that will define them for the rest of their lives. Their journey begins, as for most of us, with the act of conception. During this, a normal healthy man releases approximately 300 million sperm into a woman's vagina. The sperm swim up the reproductive tract towards the fallopian tubes, where an unfertilized egg is the prize. During each reproductive cycle, a woman usually releases one egg. The first sperm to reach it and penetrate its outer coating will be the winner. Once inside the egg, the head of the sperm containing the DNA from the father and the nucleus of the egg containing the mother's DNA are brought together 
by tiny fibers called centrosomes. The two sets of DNA fuse. Conception has occurred. This is the first cell of what will become a new human life. In the first few hours, the fertilized egg begins its journey down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. One day later, it has divided for the first time. On day two, it numbers two to four cells. On day three, eight cells. By day five, the embryo is now called a blastocyst. It's 70 to 120 cells have formed two distinct sections. The inner cell mass will become the body. The outer ring-shaped section, called the trophectoderm, the all-important placenta. But around day six, the blastocyst finally hatches through the eggshell and attaches to the lining of the uterus it begins to burrow. Here it will remain for the next 39 weeks, growing from blastocyst to embryo, from embryo to fetus, and from fetus to fully grown baby. But in a tiny number of cases, approximately one in 250, the egg does something extraordinary. It splits into two, duplicating itself and giving rise to two separate fertilized eggs. Separate, but identical. No one fully understands why this happens. But one clue may lie in the very nature of the eggs. The greatest number of identicals are conceived by women who are at the beginning or the very end of their reproductive years. Some scientists believe that in older women, the eggs are weaker and more vulnerable to splitting. What we do know for certain, if it hasn't happened within the first 14 days after conception, it never will. Identicals share one of the closest human relationships biologically. They are likely to grow up looking and sounding extremely similar yet they're not a 100% match. A small number of genes in the mother's egg sit outside the nucleus. Known as mitochondrial DNA, these genes can mutate after the egg has split, subtly modifying the way that each embryo grows. Small differences in height, build, and even personality will become more and more apparent as the twins grow up and reach maturity. This is why some scientists are now wary of using the term identical and prefer instead monozygotic or single egg twins. Identical twins are almost always the same sex. But surprisingly, there are a tiny number of boy-girl monozygotic twins. They result from an egg that contains an unusual mixture of sex chromosomes. Not the usual 
double X for a girl and XY for a boy. Occasionally, an egg contains three sex chromosomes, two X's and a Y. But if the egg divides to produce monozygotic twins, a chromosome may be lost in the process, leaving one embryo with a girl's XX combination and her monozygotic twin as an XY boy. Our single egg identical twins lodge in the womb on about day six. As with singletons, each will develop inside two sacs. An outer chorion attached to the placenta and an inner amnion or amniotic sac fusing over time. Some twins share a chorion. A very few even share an amnion. As they develop, they will be competing for space and for nutrition from their mother. Yet despite this, they may also eventually share the deepest, most enduring bond. This woman, Julie, is extremely unusual. Though she doesn't know it, her single egg has split not into two, but four. She is probably one of only a handful of women in the world currently pregnant with these unusual identical quads. The chances are one in 64 million. These tiny fetuses each have their own amnion, but they all share a chorion and with it, a single placenta. As a result, they will share a single source of food and oxygen for 30 long weeks. They will be biologically among the closest set of individuals the human body can conceive. This woman, Rachel, will undergo a totally different process. She has released two eggs, one from each ovary, and a different sperm has fertilized each one. She is pregnant with fraternal twins, sometimes called double egg or dizygotic twins. It's just like two separate pregnancies that happen to have occurred on the same day. Unlike identicals, fraternals are genetically no different from regular brothers and sisters who share only half their genes. Also unlike identicals, fraternal twinning is not a chance event. Statistics suggest that race may play a role. Among Oriental women, one pregnancy in 400 results in fraternal twins. Among American white women, it's one in 88. For some Nigerian women, twins are as frequent as one in 25 births. Other factors include periods when couples engage in more frequent sex, such as the first months of marriage or at certain times of the year. Older mothers are also more likely to have twins. At 34 years of age and from an Afro-Caribbean family, Belinda is a prime candidate. See, this baby's very active now, and this baby's really asleep. Her two fertilized eggs implant in two separate places. Each will develop separately, with its own chorion and placenta, and its own amnion. This amazing 4D scan 
shows the dividing wall of the outer layer of each membrane. Day seven. All our eggs have implanted in their mother's wombs. Over the next few days, the blastocyst begins to embed itself into the uterine lining, which by now is swollen by hormones. The small army of cells invade the uterus and gradually separate themselves into two, forming the primary connections between the placenta and the mother's bloodstream. Now sees the first change in the clump of cells inside the blastocyst. First, two layers form. By day nine, the two layers have become a disc with a cavity above it, the future amniotic sac, and a cavity below, the future yolk sac. Halfway down the disc, a groove appears, called the primitive streak. Cells migrate towards the streak and pour themselves into it. By day 14, on one edge of this primitive streak, another patch forms, known as the organizer. Until this point, all the developing cells in the body have been the same. They're known as stem cells. Now, each cell flows over the organizer, and as it does so, it is assigned its fate. Some will become part of a limb, some part of a hand, some a cell in the lens of an eye. The crest of the tiny embryo doesn't yet resemble a head. But by day 15, nerve cells are beginning to form in what will become the brain, as well as in the spinal column, all exposed and totally unprotected by skin or bone. It's now that the embryo begins to come together with the formation of three crucial layers. The ectoderm, the skin and nervous system. The mesoderm, muscles, bones and heart. And finally, the endoderm, which makes the lining of the stomach and lungs, the liver and pancreas. At this stage, there will be plenty of room for these primitive embryonic bodies to develop together side by side in the uterus. One of the first organs to form is the heart. Until now, it's been a dormant clump of muscle cells. Then, around day 22, one cell spontaneously contracts, triggering its neighbors and setting off a chain reaction until the entire vessel is beating. It begins to pump primitive blood cells through veins no thicker than a hair carrying vital supplies of food and oxygen to fuel the frantic growth. Later on, when the brain is more fully developed, it will regulate the rate of contraction, increasing the speed when more fuel is needed and slowing it when the body is at rest. In the average lifetime, a heart will beat three billion times.
After about a month, the developing embryos are still tiny. Measuring little more than six millimeters, about the size of a small kidney bean. There is still plenty of room for them to grow. The mother's womb has a capacity of six liters, about the same as a large watermelon. They have gills and a tail, a remnant of our evolutionary past. These develop at about four weeks and vanish by week six. The limb buds extend from the central trunk of the body outwards. The eyes are extremely rudimentary. The optic cup, which will become the eyeball, is also just beginning to form. And with it, a layer of pigment appearing as a black dot in the center. There will be an opening for a mouth and passageways that make up the inner ear begin to appear. The outside of the ear has yet to form. At this stage, their hearts appear to be pulsating almost on the outside of their bodies. We're at five weeks into development. Our twins are growing fast. But science is now showing that while fraternals and identicals are by far the most common types of multiple birth, there is another type too. Sets, which are a mix of both fraternal and identical. And some can even spring into life just days after their siblings have been conceived. This is 32-year-old Jennifer. One month ago, she released a single egg, which was fertilized. The egg then split to become identical twins. But the story doesn't end there. Jennifer then released a second egg. This too was fertilized. The identicals are joined in the womb by the third fraternal sibling. This process is known as superfecundation, from the Latin meaning extra fertilization. It's extremely rare. In Jennifer's case, the second egg was fertilized by the surviving sperm from the first act of intercourse. But this is not always the case. Technically, each egg could have been fertilized by sperm from two different ejaculates, even from two different men. It's estimated that for every 400 sets of fraternals, one is made up of twins who will each have a different father. Our three sets of embryos have now reached six weeks. They are nearly an inch long. Now, the basic eyeball is 85% formed. And there is the beginnings of a rudimentary lens. 
At this stage, the womb can hold many. The record is 15, but only nine have ever made it to birth. In this scan, we see five fetuses at only a few weeks old. Though Jennifer's triplets were conceived naturally, perhaps the result of superfecundation, most higher numbers of multiples have occurred thanks to modern fertility treatments. In some cases, the woman takes drugs which stimulate the production of many eggs, several of which become fertilized naturally through sex. In other cases, in vitro fertilization is used. Here, eggs are fertilized outside the womb in a Petri dish. Then two or more are put back into the uterus. Since the advent of fertility treatment in the late 1970s, the number of twins has increased by 50% the number of triplets and quads has grown by more than 400%. The embryos are now eight weeks old. They have grown to about three centimeters in length, the size of the end of your thumb. The ball is now complete. The lens is almost formed too. But the muscle that will focus it hasn't grown and won't be fully functional until the age of six months. In another couple of weeks, the fetus will have eyelids as well. The head one of the earliest structures to grow is massive, a third the size of the fetal body. As an adult, that would be the equivalent of having a head the size of a grizzly bear's on your shoulders. At birth, it will still account for one quarter of the baby's size. The rest of the body won't catch up till adolescence. The embryo is starting to look something like a tiny human and now becomes known as a fetus, from the Latin meaning offspring. By nine weeks, the brain is developing fast. On average, 2.5 million new nerve cells created every minute and 100 billion by birth. Still thus far, the baby's body now begins to twitch. The movements are involuntary reflex spasms not yet controlled by the brain. They play a vital role in stimulating the growth of muscles and in strengthening the joints. The heart is also picking up speed. After starting three weeks into development at 75 beats per minute, it gradually increases until at nine weeks, it reaches a frenetic 165 beats. This is as fast as it will ever get. It slows in the latter half of pregnancy to 125 to 150 beats. A child's heart beats on average 70 to 110 times a minute. An adult heart, 70 to 80 times a minute.
Inside the womb are twins, triplets, and quads are still unaware of each other's presence. Yet each is already affecting the other. In all multiple pregnancies, there is competition for resources. For fraternals, this competition is limited because each twin has its own chorionic sac and thus its own placenta. But for identicals, most of whom share a chorion, an unconscious battle has begun. Each needs the maximum nutrients it can extract. Yet, there is a limited supply. At birth, one twin nearly always weighs more than the other, depending on the efficiency of the placenta. These differences tend to even out as the babies grow up. Our fetuses are now 10 weeks old, one quarter of the way through development. Until now, they have been living in their own secret world of the human womb. But the mothers are about to get their first view of these tiny, delicate creatures growing inside them. And for some, this will hold great surprises. Many more of us may have been twins than we imagine. At between 10 and 14 weeks, a pregnant woman will usually go for her first scan. Ultrasound has revolutionized our understanding of fetal development. These pictures are produced by sending ultra-high frequency sound waves, far too high for us to hear, from the probe into the body of the mother. The sound waves penetrate soft tissue, but bounce back off denser structures like bone. From the pattern of reflected waves, the computer creates an image of the hidden fetus. Traditionally, this would be a plain two-dimensional image, but new technology means that we can now see the images in 3D and sequence them in time, producing so-called four-dimensional scans. As well as checking the size and health of the developing fetus, this scan will usually be the first time most mothers find out whether they're carrying one baby or more. This is baby... That should be baby six. Oh, my goodness. Oh, look at And ultrasound scans have let us in on a startling secret. Many more of us than we realize traveled our first few months in the womb with one or more companions, only to have them vanish before birth. This scan, taken at 12 weeks, shows two fetuses developing in their mother's womb. But there are three gestational spaces. The one on the right used to contain a third fetus. Four weeks ago, it was developing just like the others. Now, it has simply gone. Slowly shrinking, 
then being reabsorbed back into the uterine lining. It's called vanishing twin syndrome. Scientists think that this is normally caused by chromosomal abnormalities or inadequate resources from the overworked placenta. Nature sacrifices one or more to make sure the others survive. Some mothers know they have a vanishing twin as they see it like this on a scan. Some discover at birth when it occasionally shows up as a small piece of fibrous tissue on the placenta. But many mothers, and indeed their surviving babies, will never know it has happened. Most of us find it surprising that twins can vanish at all. What's even more surprising is how often it occurs. Some scientists estimate it could be as high as 21% of all fraternal twins that lose their sibling. In the case of identicals who share a placenta, this rises to a startling 50%. Some have gone as far as claiming that one in eight of all people may have started life as a twin only to have their sibling disappear while still in the womb. What's more, scientists now think they can point to clues which may indicate which of us have lost a twin. Occasionally, a set of identical twins will be born known as mirror image twins. Instead of being identical images of each other, they are instead mirror images. Where one is right-handed, the other will be left-handed. Mirror image twins are formed when the egg splits late, nine days after conception, when the egg has already decided its left and right side. And in some rare cases, even the internal organs will be mirrored. One twin has their heart on the left, the other on the right. Put this together with the fact that left-handedness occurs more frequently among twins than singletons, and you come up with a startling theory. Some left-handed people may be the surviving half of a vanished twin pair. Identicals, fraternals, mirror images, and super fecundations. Each has valuable lessons to teach us about how we all develop and come to be. But among the most profound lessons is one taught by the most extraordinary type of twins, Siamese or conjoined twins. There are two theories about how conjoined twins form. One holds that an egg splits so late, it never fully separates. The other, that it splits early on, but the two developing embryos are somehow drawn back and fused together. The second idea is the more popular, and there's an intriguing piece of evidence to support it. Each of us has adhesion molecules tiny molecules which act like the Velcro of the body. As our organs develop in the womb, two arms, two legs, a right side and a left side, our adhesion molecules 
pull these two sides together in a matching and broadly symmetrical pattern. The molecules are programmed only to attract their like, an arm to an arm, the left side of our face to the right side, and so on. Conjoined twins are only ever joined by matching organs. Head to head, chest to chest, or waist to waist, like mirror images of each other. This suggests that the adhesion molecules in each baby are confusing their own bodies with their neighbors, and literally fusing the two embryos together. We're approaching the end of the first trimester. Our fetuses are beginning to resemble a human baby for the first time. And begin to act in ways till now we were never able to see. We're approaching the end of the first trimester, a milestone in gestation. Our embryos have grown from eggs smaller than a grain of sand to fetuses as big as a fist. They are beginning to look like human beings. At the first 12-week scan, parents will delight at seeing the face of the baby to come. They're growing more robust each day, and the risk of miscarriage is now very small for most. Although statistically, the risks for twins that share a placenta are higher. It's still too early to tell whether the fetuses will be boys or girls. Every fetus has a protuberance in the genital area. But it doesn't yet give a real clue to their gender. Gender identification is an even tougher challenge when there are multiple fetuses in the womb. It's hard for an ultrasound operator even to identify which genitals belong to which fetus. At this stage, there is still plenty of room. Even the quads aren't yet touching. But that's about to change. For multiples, the second trimester will be a dramatic time in their development. It's during this period, from three months to six months, that they will make their first real movements. No longer the twitches of the developing nervous system, but the first signs of recognizable infant behavior. behavior that will bring them into contact with each other for the very first time. The network of nerves has now extended to most parts of the body. The brain can finally control its own limbs. Nobody knows why, but females tend to move first. Kicking, pushing. 
In the case of single fetuses, these movements meet with no resistance. But when two or more siblings are sharing a womb, action leads to reaction. When one kicks, the other responds. When one pushes or touches, the others tend to act too. Scientists believe this early pattern of action and reaction, seen clearly in this 4D ultrasound of fraternal twins, may be beneficial and may play an important role in accelerating their development. This early into the second trimester, our fetuses are still not conscious of the presence of their brothers and sisters sharing the limited space of the womb with them. But this won't be the case for long. At 16 weeks, a growing fetus is moving its body in ever more intricate maneuvers. And it's developing an awareness of the space around itself. And here, a multiple has another advantage over a single fetus. This sense, proprioception, is an unconscious awareness of the body in space. And it will be essential later in life as it helps us to navigate our world. As adults, we take in information through a variety of organs. Eyes, ears and nose building up a mental understanding of where we are. Thanks to this, we can coordinate our movements, standing without falling over, running and jumping, and avoiding solid objects. This sense of awareness begins with our early movements in the womb, as a fetus explores its environment for the first time. For a single fetus, this exploration is usually limited to the two objects in his grasp, his own body and the umbilical cord. But for twins and higher sets of multiples, there is a much busier and more varied setting. The tiny number of identical twins who share an amniotic sac have no such barriers. They have been shown to grasp each other's hands, feet, umbilical cords, and even each other's faces. But even multiples who inhabit their own separate amniotic sacs can easily interact. The amnion is highly flexible. It's also extremely thin, about two cells thick. When looking on a 4D scan, it's almost invisible. Despite this, the amnion is very strong. as thin as a sheet of food wrap, but extremely tough, able to stretch and flex as the fetus explores its surroundings.
We are now at 18 weeks, halfway through gestation. And we're approaching the stage when our fetus's senses will really start to develop. The fetus's digestive system is beginning to function. Although they currently get all the nourishment they need from the placenta directly into their bloodstream, they will need to be able to swallow and digest from the moment they're born. For this reason, they start to open their mouths and drink in some of the amniotic fluid that surrounds them. You can see their early efforts clearly in this 4D scan. Some of the flavor from the food the mother eats is transferred through the placenta into the fetus's bloodstream and then out into the amniotic fluid. The fetuses sample it as their taste buds develop. Because twins are sampling the same flavors in the womb at the same time, they may have similar taste in foods as they grow up. With their senses developing apace, our fetuses are about to begin using them. Twins and other multiples are known for a particular characteristic in utero. Scientists have even witnessed them playing games together. We're 20 weeks into gestation. The fetuses are about 140 millimeters, small enough to cradle in the palm of their mother's hand. They cannot open their eyes yet, but the main structure of the eyeball is complete. The iris, which controls the amount of light that enters the eye, is forming, but the pupil does not appear until closer to birth. The fifth month is an important time for the nervous system. The number of nerve cells increase rapidly, 2.5 million neurons per minute. A hundred billion by birth. Their biggest task now is to grow. Yet this is also about to become their biggest problem. Up until now, each has developed at approximately the same pace as singletons, but this will become increasingly restricted. Eventually, the womb will simply not have room for two full-size babies. This poses a dilemma. Neither benefits from reducing the amount he consumes and remaining small, on the other hand, if they both become too big, together they trigger a premature labor which might endanger them both. Gradually, their rate of growth begins to slow. From now on in, the obstetrician will monitor both the mother and her fetuses regularly. He must make sure they continue to grow at an equal pace and slow enough for each of their systems to reach maturity before labor. A woman's womb can contain a fetus of up to approximately five and a half kilos. Usually single babies are born at anywhere between two and a half and five and a half kilos. Twins between two 
and nearly three kilos, and triplets at between one and a half and two and a quarter kilos. Quads and higher multiples are sometimes born at just one kilo each and need weeks of intensive care. The taller a woman, the longer her abdomen and the greater weight she can carry. Jennifer, carrying our triplets, is almost 1.8 meters tall. She has a distinct advantage over shorter women. Her stature will allow the fetuses to gestate for longer, crucial for survival outside the womb. Baby A is down here. Right here in this it area. It goes from here to there. And then baby B is from right here to here. And then baby C. We're 24 weeks into development. The lungs will start to form surfactant, which helps babies breathe after they're born. It's a greasy substance that allows the lungs to separate while a breath is being drawn. Because higher multiples are almost always born prematurely, doctors give the mother a steroid to help surfactant form. Our babies are now too large to be captured collectively in the field of a 4D scan. But for the first time, their mothers will see them interacting. As each baby appears individually, it's often possible to see the limb of one of the others. These 4D scans show one twin pushing against the other. Even those fraternal twins, in their own chorions, feel their neighbor impinging on their space. Though space is becoming cramped, our twins and other multiples are about to start engaging in one of the most fascinating of all prenatal developmental activities, game playing. What's more, some of these apparent games seem to persist even when the twins are outside the womb. In one case, a pair of fraternal twins were regularly seen in scans, cheek to cheek, either side of the dividing chorions. At about one year of age, these twins' favorite game was to stand on either side of a curtain and begin to laugh as they touched each other through the fabric. Scientists think their prenatal behavior simply carried over into early childhood. Beyond play, twins who behave aggressively in utero may carry it forward into childhood. Another case involved a twin pair at about four months gestation. One twin was dominant and aggressive, the other quieter and more submissive. Often, the first twin would push or hit the other. The quieter twin would withdraw and place his head on the placenta as if for comfort or protection. After birth, as the twins grew up, they showed the same relationship pattern. At around the age of four, 
whenever a fight broke out. The quieter twin would retreat to his bedroom and put his head on the pillow. These fraternal twins are positioned head to toe. They look as if they're fighting. The 4D scan captures one of the twins kicking the other's head. These movements may not be as aggressive as they seem. It may simply be a consequence of their relative positions. The twin on the left is probably kicking just to exercise his leg. However, the twin on the right is perhaps certainly learning a valuable early life lesson using his hand to protect his face. Twins are a reproductive accident. But single egg identicals provide an incredible opportunity for scientists to understand how we acquire much about our personalities, skills, and even intelligence. It's 26 weeks into gestation. Suddenly, the eyes open as the eyelids separate for the first time. And some scientists believe the babies can now see. In the darkness, the fetuses might just be able to make out the shapes of their siblings. For singletons, the view is limited. For twins, there's much more to take in when light occasionally penetrates the womb. The inner and middle ear, which have been growing since week four, are now fully formed and functional. The fetuses can hear the mother's heartbeat and the rushing sounds of the amniotic fluid. They can also hear muffled sounds from the outside world, including music and voices. Twins are now a quarter of their birth weight. Triplets and quads a third. Their brains are still developing extremely fast. By birth, the neural circuits will comprise of 100 trillion synapses. Much about each twin is very similar. Yet, as we have seen, there are also differences. Differences which will affect both looks and personality. It's difficult to tell precisely how or where these similarities and differences originate. Certainly, many of the most striking similarities are down to their shared genes. As well as having almost identical bodies, single egg twins have almost identical brains. These scans show certain patterns of grey matter on the brains of a pair of fraternal twins. These brains belong to a pair of identicals. The latter set is much more similar. It shouldn't surprise us then that scientists studying identicals when they grow up find they tend to share views about subjects as diverse as modern art, and the death penalty. Identicals are also usually closer to each other in IQ than fraternals, and have been shown to share similar susceptibilities to anger, stress, 
thrill-seeking, and happiness. But not every major characteristic of twins is inherited. Scientists now think that the environment in the womb can have an effect, sometimes a dramatic one. Fraternal twins, who derive from two eggs, share half their genes. And their IQs often differ. Yet new research is also finding subtle variations in the IQs of identicals. At first, this seems strange. For identicals are very nearly exact copies of each other and have usually made the long journey through gestation in very close proximity. Most identical twins share a single chorion and therefore a single food source and a single source of oxygen. Some identicals, about 30%, split sufficiently early after conception that each acquired their own chorion and with it their own placenta. Studies show that the IQs of twins with separate placentas are more likely to vary than the IQs of twins who share a placenta. The minor differences in the quality and degree of food and oxygen they've received has subtly modified their brains and thus their mental abilities. Sharing a placenta can also lead to complications if one twin restricts the blood flow to the other. Advances in fetal surgery means that doctors can now treat this condition using laser technology in the womb that was originally developed for the Star Wars project to bring down nuclear weapons from space. We're now 28 weeks into development. One of the things the doctor pays particular attention to is the umbilical cord. This masterpiece of natural design is thick and resilient. It contains two arteries and a vein that coil around each other in such a way that they don't get knotted or kinked. Even if the umbilical cord wraps around the baby's neck, it can still deliver the vital nutrients. But for twins sharing an amniotic sac, this life-giving supply line also presents a unique danger. Identicals can get entangled in each other's cords, cutting off the flow of food and oxygen, either to themselves or their co-twin. This 4D scan shows just such a situation with heavily entangled cords. The main reason that identicals who share a single amniotic sac are often delivered by caesarean is to reduce the risk of entanglement at the most critical moment when the babies are born. In the last weeks before birth, the babies are putting on as much weight as they can. The larger and stronger they are, the better. At seven months, Julie's quads now weigh between half a kilo to a kilo, close to their predicted birth weight.
One of the things doctors look for is something called twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. Ideally, they all develop at roughly the same rate and that they all gain roughly the same weight. But identicals like Julie's are like trees growing from the same roots. As a result, they all harmlessly exchange blood across their shared placenta. However, between 5 to 38% of monozygotic twins, the circulation between them becomes unbalanced, and one gets too much blood overloading his or her cardiovascular system and may die from heart failure. The other fetus does not get enough blood and may die from severe anemia. There are several complex reasons as to why it happens. It's neither hereditary nor genetic. But when it does happen, it normally occurs between 15 and 28 weeks of gestation, roughly the middle months of pregnancy. It can be treated by cutting off the blood supply from one twin to the other, using an endoscopic laser. Before it was introduced, twins with this rare condition only stood about a 20% chance of survival. Now, it's between 65 and 70%. Our triplets are most of the way through gestation. And after seven long months in the womb, they are about to glimpse their first view of the outside world. While doctors monitor the ongoing health of the fetuses from the outside, the fetuses' bodies can also regulate and control their development, at least to some degree. If one twin is not receiving enough blood in the womb, his body will take steps to preserve the all-important brain. He is actually able to regulate the volume that different parts of his body receives. In this case, pumping only a limited amount to his extremities, which need it less, and redirecting more blood to his brain, to prevent it being starved and therefore possibly damaged. It's a miracle of fetal biology. And even when the babies grow up, the legacy of this process lives on. But the place to look is not the brain, it's the fingertips. As our fingertips develop, they receive blood from the veins. This makes them swell, forming distinctive patterns known as whirls which are most obvious on the right index finger. The fingers on the left hand share the same blood supply as our legs. If we have directed blood away from our legs and other extremities during development, we have fewer whirls on the left index finger. These patterns can help to indicate how healthy our heart is to be later in life. It's 30 weeks. Now the fetuses have everything in place. 
Intricate details like their eyelashes have formed. For single babies, this final 10-week period is about one thing, growing. But for multiples, it's not so easy. There's no space left in the womb. The babies are doing a lot of pushing and shoving as they compete for room. The eyeballs can move in their sockets and react to the light. It's been observed that if a strong light is shone on the abdomen, the baby will react to it. Thirty-two weeks. Single babies would still be about eight weeks from birth, but for our triplets, the big moment is much closer. All multiples present a medical challenge. A delicate balance between leaving them inside long enough to be sufficiently large at birth, but not so long that they endanger the mother or themselves. Critically, their lungs must mature fully enough for them to breathe on their own. 34 weeks in the womb is ideal for triplets. Because of the dangers of natural labor, the doctors will recommend a cesarean. For the past eight months, Jennifer's triplets have had no one but each other for companionship. They were conceived together, they've grown side by side and fed side by side. They've heard the same sounds, seen the same sights. Now they're about to leave their cozy world of in-womb interaction and face the bright lights of the operating theater. They will also meet their mother for the very first time. In Jennifer's case, the doctors decide not to wait until 34 weeks. Instead, they settle on 32. Jennifer has chosen to have a local anesthetic. With no pain in her abdomen, she will be conscious the whole time. The surgeon prepares to make the first incision. Inside, the babies are unaware of what's coming. Caesareans are always performed quickly to reduce the risks of complications. The surgeon cuts the membrane. The first baby is out. It's one of the identicals, a boy. The baby takes his first breath and emits a healthy scream. The cord to the placenta, which has been his lifeline for eight months, is finally cut. Working briskly, the surgeon looks for his identical brother, who is in the same chorionic sac. He's out quickly. But there is a delay to find the final fraternal brother. He's in his own chorionic sac. Finally, he too emerges, feet first. 
The three babies are fit and healthy, despite the cramped conditions of the final few months. They weigh the triplets. They're just over two kilos each. But they're eight weeks premature. High-tech incubators that imitate the cozy world of the womb will help them to put on weight and bring their lungs to maturity. In undeveloped countries, multiples are placed together for warmth and comfort. The twins are at 38 weeks, the optimal time for birth. About half of twins are delivered by cesarean, which many mothers prefer to a natural birth. But Rachel's given birth before. Now she'll have to decide how her twins will come into the world. Rachel's twins are about to be born. They spent the past 38 weeks in the womb. The baby's lungs are robust and their bodies are ready. At birth, twins normally weigh just over two kilos. Their smaller bodies make them good candidates for a natural birth. This is what Rachel wants. She had two children like this before and feels confident and capable of a natural birth. A hormone triggers labor. The baby normally turns head down as the pregnancy comes to term. With two in the womb, this is more difficult. The baby positioned nearest to the head of the birth canal will be first. The amniotic waters have broken. The baby's head pushes through the remnants of the sac that protected it for nine months. With the cervix fully dilated, the muscles of the uterus continue to push the baby towards the outside world. Rachel has been pushing for three hours. The first baby begins to engage its head, and Rachel gradually pushes the baby out. The cord is wrapped around his neck as can happen with multiples. The midwife quickly unwraps it. It's a boy, weighing in at just over three kilos, a healthy weight for a twin. time in nine months, this baby has a womb all to itself. Uh. Ten minutes after the first birth, the head quickly appears. 
and the second baby follows her brother out into the outside world. This time, it's a girl, at a lighter 2.7 kilos. After being separated for a few minutes, the fraternal twins are reunited. Our mother of quads will face the most intensive birth. Her babies have been in the womb for seven months, a full two months less than Singleton's, and each weighs only one kilo, one quarter of the weight of an average baby. If each had the womb to themselves, they would remain here for much longer. But space has become impossibly cramped. Up until the mid-70s, Multiple sets were usually born naturally, but today, a large medical team awaits them. The quads have reached 29 weeks and three days. The doctors decide that it's time to operate before the risks get too great. With a large number of medical staff present, all focus is on the mother and the impending birth. The surgeon cuts through the abdomen and tries to locate the first baby. Each has its own inner amniotic sac. Cutting through the first amnion, the baby is out quickly. It's a girl, just under a kilo in weight. She is followed by the second baby, another girl, who is equally small. The team takes each baby to check their vital signs. The biggest concern is whether the babies can breathe unassisted. These babies are being born almost 11 weeks earlier than Singleton's. The doctor grabs the third, smaller baby. He removes it from the uterus, and it is taken for examination by the midwife. With only one baby left, this extraordinary quadruplet pregnancy is nearly over. <laughs> the final and fourth baby is eventually delivered. All four are girls. Incredibly, they all weigh about one kilo, one quarter of the weight of an average singleton. They too will have to spend several weeks in incubators to mature to a level where they can go home. Rachel's twins are eight weeks old, but have been growing together for almost a year. Each is beginning to acquire their own personality. And though they are fraternal rather than identical, they are pretty similar. Influenced to some extent by their genes, 
and to some by their shared time in the womb. Although identicals will be much more similar, a product of their close genetics, their upbringing will also play a part. Jennifer's triplets are home from hospital. They can now breathe on their own. At this young age, all three seem very similar. But as they grow up, the fraternal twin is likely to diverge more than the two identicals. Julie's quads are now three months old and putting on weight fast despite being born at around one kilo each. Julie and Jose feed them special formula milk with extra calories to accelerate their growth. It's taken this long for the four to reach the average birth weight of just over three kilos. Even today, with modern medical advances, multiple births remain reproductive miracles. Although they are only a small percentage of human births, they hold a fascination for us all. For science, they are not only a challenge, but also a window on reproduction, giving greater insights into the remarkable world within the womb. And for our twins, triplets and quads, those early interactions with their brothers and sisters in the womb will connect and define them as they grow up and provide a source of comfort and inspiration throughout their lives.